our second session of our conference. It is called uh, Late Social Architecture, the Vehicle of Post-Colonial Resistance. And we are going to focus, our speakers are going to focus now on East European states, which became Soviet after the Second World War, and the communist regime wasn't as rooted there as in Ukraine, for example. Uh, but still, we can talk about architecture as uh, in a post-colonial discourse uh, due to growing attention to historical motives and due to growing attention to public spaces and ethnical motives and so on. Uh, so, and as I am moderator of this panel, Tetyana Vodotyka, uh, I'll allow myself to start maybe with a question. Um, is uh, this just an, an impression from the perspective of 2021 that the uh, late Soviet architecture is a vehicle of post-colonial discourse or was it, it, or was it real so? Uh, and I'll announce uh, the time regime of this panel also. We will have 20-22 minutes for each speaker to have more time for discussion and questions and comments, so please, the audience, note everything you have to talk and ask for. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Mancus Martinez. Uh, his, uh, uh, his report is named, uh, gained in translation, Postmodern Architecture in Late Soviet Lithuania, so please start. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me here, and uh, thank you for the intro. Yeah, the slides are here. So uh, I'm uh, uh, trained as an architect, and uh, I graduated in the late 20th century, at the end of the 20th century, and uh, uh, when this influence of postmodernism was still uh, was still there, it was uh, diminishing. But uh, as I worked with the uh, Elder generation of architects, so uh, it was interesting uh, how they perceive uh, uh, this uh, period uh, of, of this late 80s. And uh, uh, so, my presentation will be uh, a little bit from the perspective of the architects. And uh, I would like to start uh, uh, from the architects' library uh, in the 80s and how printed matter. Uh, has shaped the postmodernist generation of late Soviet architects. And uh, it's a nice coincidence that we are in a library. And uh, here is uh, the uh, a little bit strange looking copy of a familiar magazine. And it's a Russian version of uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, uh, which was published in the former Soviet Union uh, from as early as 1961. And uh, and became one of the channels of presenting Western architecture to the public. It was uh, widely read by Soviet architects, and later this bilingual magazine, it uh, has transformed into a rather sloppy looking copy, Xerox copy of, with only the translated title. And uh, in the 80s, it continued to, pre to present the ideas of postmodern architecture, which was eagerly embraced by a generation of younger architects in the Soviet uh, bloc, and as we heard uh, yesterday in Kiev as well. So here are a couple of issues from 1981, and the very first issue is, uh, has all the big names of postmodern architecture on the front cover, and among others, uh, uh, Bofil Bota, Portoghese, Krier, Stirling, and Venturi, and the Russian title uh, Sovremenna Architectura is written underneath. So, and now, almost half a century later, while turning the pages of this, uh, like, rather poorly copied magazine, one could pose a rather naive question. Was Soviet postmodernism only a bleak copy of its Western counterpart, or did it follow the in a logic of local architectural culture, presenting itself as an other kind of global postmodernity. In the latter case, what regional, historical, and vernacular features were added to the global concept of, of postmodernism, and what has made this kind of architecture acceptable 
And this presentation tries to give a closer look at the cultural background of the late Soviet context and the motivations behind this so-called postmodern turn and uh, local translations of postmodernity. And just first of all, I, I couldn't help myself making a rather blunt comparison between the um, chronological comparison between the West and the East and modern architecture died in 1972 as uh, Charles Jenks has uh, self-claimed and uh, almost sim simultaneously in 1974 uh, the recently finished Vilnius Lesdine district was awarded the prestigious Lenin Prize uh, for architecture and so we see rather two very different uh, situations but later in the 80s uh, the Postmodern architecture became a dominant tendency in Lithuanian architecture. And if uh, just uh, fast forward to 1989, when uh, this uh, Mikola Zielinska sub gallery in Kaunas was officially opened and it was immediately recognized as one of the prime examples of uh, postmodern architecture in Lithuania. Uh, you see this, this complex spatial com composition with plenty of historical references and uh, like uh, this main portal on, on, on columns. And uh, this uh, ideas of postmodernism were important to the entire generation of architects. Uh, well, younger generation born between the 50s and 65. Uh, and the, in the 80s, uh, postmodernism vernacular and historical references became a, a very visible architectural tendency. And the critics uh, considered this uh, kind of architecture to be somewhat artificial sometimes and uh, specified it as a magazine-like. And I think uh, this term magazine-like uh, appeared at this particular time. And just to rewind back uh, to 1980, uh, as early as 1980, one of the most influential architects of the time, Gediminas Barivikas, said that, uh, and I quote, uh, contemporary tendency in the world's architecture, which is often called postmodernism, is advantageous to making our own local architecture. The shift of architecture from the boundless influence of technology to the cultural context benefits us as we have rich urban and architectural heritage, deep urban and rural construction traditions, and slightly limited technical possibilities. Uh, so you have all the keywords in one sentence. I mean, uh, like uh, postmodernism, local, uh, boundless influence of technology, context, heritage, construction traditions, and so on. And uh, Gediminas Borovikas was one of the informal leaders of the generation, uh, later the chief architect of Vilnius. Uh, here, here is his project from 1984, the addition to a small uh, church, or rather chapel. So we have this symbolic boundaries b between the 80s, the, the, the 80, the quote of Baravikas and uh, 1989, uh, the, this potential high point of postmodernism. And uh, I would like to expand on the topic uh, by tracing a series of oppositions which could illustrate the aesthetic and sociocultural tensions uh, of this uh, tendency. And uh, first of all, uh, uh, the arrival of postmodern sensibilities uh, to the Soviet space coincided with the uh, re-evaluation of uh, Soviet uh, uh, socialist urbanity. And uh, from the 70s onwards, uh, new urban developments and especially micro districts were increasingly criticized. And uh, on the urban scale, uh, there were a lot of discuss discussions how to develop them further and uh, strengthen their identity, get rid of the monotony and uh, pursue more humane scale. And uh, this uh, one such example of introducing a different kind of urbanity was the so-called public service uh, centers or just shopping centers in today's understanding, uh, which were serving this uh, micro, district, micro districts. And uh, these uh, buildings were like, uh, well, in, in all micro, micro districts, but in major Lithuanian cities, they were like, uh, the architects tried to introduce a new kind of urbanity with, with uh, some complex structures and even some uh, postmodern forms. So it's, uh, mm, there was a public center in, in, in Vilnius, uh, service center in Kalniechi, and uh, uh, a project for a service center in um, Shiulei. And uh, this, uh, 
they, they, they try to just uh, return to these classical elements of architecture with, with uh, like, uh, not only with elements like columns or like uh, gazebos and uh, similar things, but uh, also uh, composition of streets and squares. And uh, one of the attempts to reintroduce the um, traditional urbanity on the bigger scale was uh, the unrealized design project uh, in the Cholet, Azure's district in Cholet, it's 1984. The big, bigger picture with the square is, uh, is here. And uh, the proposed urban plan focused on the small scale, mixed use, attention to pedestrians, uh, the importance of creating city blocks, uh, well, etc. All these uh, elements that we now associate with the uh, postmodern urbanism, if, if you wish. And uh, another interesting example of uh, reintroducing the human scale were the projects for pedestrian streets. And here is uh, the pedestrian zone designed for uh, the city of Cholet. It's uh, late 70s, but it also stands out as an example of comprehensively designed system of uh, uh, street furniture, greenery, and elements of uh, visual design. But uh, unfortunately, these ideas uh, uh, have never been implemented on a bigger scale. I mean, uh, I, I, I think so for, for the housing estates, uh, and they were more successfully employed for humanizing uh, the public spaces on smaller projects like uh, kind of uh, squares, uh, like smaller squares or piazzettas in, 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 in the historical settings and so on. So uh, another aspect is uh, the uh, local tradition and this uh, uh, ethno architecture and traditional uh, uh, like uh, silhouettes of the buildings. And they were usually uh, applied in rural settings and uh, traditional forms and motifs uh, became a widely popular in designs for culture houses in smaller towns or resorts in um, or vacation complexes in, in the resorts. Uh, there is a quote of uh, British journalist Tanato Levan uh, who as an outsider wrote uh, about the um, Soviet period in the 90s. And uh, I would quote, uh, after Stalin's death and Khrushchev thaw in the 50s, there was a tangible literary move, especially in Lithuania and Latvia, towards folkloric themes and imagery. And today this is reflected not only in straightforward uses of traditional forms and motives, but in sophisticated postmodern reworkings of them. So he speaks uh, mostly about literature, but uh, it could be applied to architecture too. And these uh, forms and elements uh, that were heavily indebted with to folk architecture, they were uh, and ornamentation, uh, they were like balancing somehow on the borderline between professionalism and uh, amateur architecture, let's say. And uh, such tendencies often uh, were veered uh, towards uh, sentimentally ethnographic forms or uh, in their own way they continued the uh, interwar pursuits of uh, national style. So it's uh, a couple of uh, projects from uh, smaller, smaller cities and uh, public centers in, 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 in so-called maybe kolkhoz settlements as they were called at the time. So uh, another thing is about uh, the tendencies that were coming from the West, that they were usually seen as uh, forward thinking, and uh, postmodernism was accepted as a new and progressive tendency by the architects, but quite paradoxically, this new and progressive tendency was employed for raising historical awareness and related to the so-called return of memory, a sudden and passionate interest in the past among the social mainstream. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah. So uh, in Lithuanian architecture, uh, this um, interpretation of historical forms was based not only the general he heritage of architecture, and I want to show a couple of examples of uh, Konas, uh, which is uh, famous for its interwar modernism and uh, uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, this uh, authentical historical heritage of the city uh, and its interpretation became uh, highly evident in the works of, of the architects of, of uh, the time. 
so for instance, this res residential building in the center, it's, uh, it is located on the same block as an interwar bank of uh, Lithuania, uh, built in the interwar period, and they are just like uh, uh, the different uh, corners of the, of the same block. Or, so uh, these uh, historical references are r rather visible and they are like easily digestible. And uh, for instance, uh, office building, uh, which has this, uh, uh, well, actually it was finished in the 21st century, but it was conceived in the late 90s. Uh, on the top left uh, is uh, a new building with a big way bay window and rounded balconies and so on, and it just kind of replicates uh, the same the, the building on the same block, the the old uh, cinema theater from the uh, interwar period. And uh, yet another example, it's uh, close to Kaunas in 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 the in the Litus. It's a, a town like municipal hall. Before it was like uh, had another name. But yeah, it, it, it was an important civic building and the architects uh, chose to like, uh, I don't know if the word replicate is uh, the exact term, but uh, yeah, somehow they found the inspirations of uh, the Vitotas, the Great War Museum in Kaunas, just uh, making this uh, uh, bell uh, tower similar to, to, to uh, the clock tower similar to, to to the uh, tower from the mid-war uh, period. And uh, yet uh, we, 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 we could find uh, such examples and uh, in other cities, for instance, in the city of Shaolei, which has uh, also had this uh, interwar heritage and uh, the architects eagerly uh, accepted all kinds of classical elements. And uh, for instance, in this railway station area competition, we see also, uh, uh, an el a square element, uh, I mean, it was the main square uh, in front of the railway station and we see a, a silhouette of Lithuania, it's like kind of like uh, homage uh, to maybe to Charles Moore, Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans. And uh, here I can also can help comparing the influences of Soviet modernism and Soviet postmodernism. And while uh, Lithuanian modernists were inspired by uh, the northern architecture, Scandinavian architecture, uh, postmodernists were partly inspired by uh, historical or interwar architecture. And uh, so if modernism could be interpreted as a retreat to a different um, place, so postmodernism in some aspects uh, could be uh, interpreted as a retreat to a, a different time. And uh, yet another aspect is uh, uh, that postmodern architecture is known for its irony and inclinations toward uh, uh, pop culture and uh, these aspects were also uh, present in late Soviet architecture and they were uh, connected to the birth of Soviet uh, consumerism. And uh, this uh, uh, here is uh, the same example of, of pedestrian street uh, uh, in Shaolei, but it had rather like ex explicit visual uh, elements, which were which were very visible and uh, like daring for, for for the for the time. And uh, Soviet consumerism was a result uh, of the stabilized and growing economy during the Brezhnev era of stagnation. And uh, after admitting that promotion of consumption is a necessary element of modernization, uh, the government started concerning itself with an improvement of the population's domestic and material status. And eventually this concern had obtained the, the form of designing interiors of public buildings, which became an interesting typology of the time. And uh, besides uh, allocating a few percent of the construction budget to the majority of public buildings, uh, to the art box became a widespread practice. And uh, as uh, an art uh, historian say, that uh, the late Soviet period was the golden age of uh, monumental art, uh, uh, such as murals, sculptures, and stained glass. And the architects were uh, teaming up with artists and uh, later with the designers who brought their own sensibilities in the final design. And the smaller volume and cheaper, like 
objects and buildings such as interiors of cafes, restaurants and pharmacies, uh, usually were the first works of the, the young generation of architects. And for instance, this uh, particular pharmacy in Kaunas, uh, uh, its interior includes a furniture design, or a mural somewhere on the left, uh, uh, special fittings for the ceilings and so on. And it's, uh, it's also included in the National Registry of uh, Protected Buildings and it's, it has this tag, postmodernism, uh, on its name. So it's like officially recognized as a protected object. And one of the most talked about uh, objects in the 80s in Lithuania was the, uh, okay, I'll just skip this uh, restaurant in Konas, and another one in, also in Konas, it was uh, the reconstruction of the mid-war villa of, 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 of an architect. And this uh, particular interior of the restaurant Astoria in Vilnius, which was decorated in vivid colors and various historic motifs, uh, the restaurant was located in the historic building and uh, had, which had its own decor. And uh, the central element of this interior was the contemporary interpretation of historical vocabulary. And uh, the interior also contained the, the matching and the original and the slightly uh, extravagant for furniture, uh, which, which uh, was comparable to the postmodern aesthetics of the Memphis group, maybe. And uh, then uh, some of other pictures of, of, of the interior of this um, uh, restaurant. And I always keep checking on this particular slide since uh, if it's not upside down, but it's not, and uh, as you can see, it's the deliberate intention of the authors to mix the uh, perceptions up a little bit, uh, which is a very postmodern way, I would say. And the ceiling looks like the floor and uh, the, uh, the, the, the furniture looks uh, this, like cabinets and mirrors look somehow inverted upside down and so on. So, uh, with the weakening of the regime of the late Soviet era, uh, there was more freedom to go beyond what was accepted and uh, what was allowed by the system. And uh, often to achieve this freedom, some kind of in ingenuity was uh, applied. And uh, however, this ingenuity has to be distinguished from the so-called postmodern game in a Western sense, which, is, which was characterized by free manipulation of cultural contexts. And this uh, uh, invention produced things and uh, realities that were only similar to normal or real ones. So the Soviet and post-Soviet mannerisms had a different uh, social, cultural context. So just to conclude, uh, what was gained in this uh, translation of postmodern of postmodernism in Soviet context? So I would say that. Uh, the arrival of global postmodernism to, to the Second World brought forward the inner contradictions that uh, of the Soviet system and Soviet modernity, and while having adopted an aesthetic regime similar to Western postmodernism, its Lithuanian counterpart presented several paradoxes, such as uh, global architectural tendency helping, helping to strengthen local features and national identity, a vanguard trend employed for national uh, for historical sentiment, the embrace of postmodern consumer culture in the context of not 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 surplus but scarcity, and uh, of course uh, uh, resistance against Soviet modernization. But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, postmodernism functioned within the boundaries of what uh, anthropologist uh, Alexei Yurchak defined as the profound internal displacement of Soviet everyday life, which was co capable of combining seemingly incompatible things. And because of this, uh, postmodernism could be interpreted both as a resistance against Soviet modernization and also as an attempt to transform, improve and humanize it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and uh, my privilege is to pass the word to uh, Alicia Gzhovska from National Museum in Warsaw, so please. Uh, 
Strzeszyn District and Paul Poznan, an experimental model of local democracy before 1989. Okay, great. So, thank you very much for having me here. I will be reading because I tend to go into, uh, you know, stories. Uh, so, on uh, 24th October 1985, <coughs> a competition for Strzeszyn District in Poznań was announced, just like several other similar urban and architectural competitions that took place that year and that decade. Concern about area of 385 hectares, located five kilometers far from city center, appeared uh, particularly interesting to me and special enough to present it to international audience uh, due to its objectives. Uh, so the first objective, the obvious one, was to find a proper solution for development of new district acknowledging all of its particularities. Um, as was later published in Architectura Journal, um, Particular emphasis was put on the composition of the district, communication and the location in the Poznan East-West Green Belt that should be preserved. And on contemporary uh, satellite uh, photography, you can, I hope, see it. I went to uh, the second objective uh, involved issues related to the organization of investments. Uh, that is, competition participants had to provide solutions on how communal land should be divided, distributed and managed. Uh, I went through documentation of many Polish post-war uh, competitions, but that was the first time I faced something like this, that architectural competition requires providing administrative solutions. Why was it like that? Um, to make complex answer short, inefficiency of socialist state construction apparatus. Uh, I'm showing here an outdoor model of another housing district in Poznań, development of which began in early 1950s and two decades later, as you can see, was still in progress. Even if so-called factories of houses in Poznań were particularly well managed, this kind of uh, construction method, besides having many disadvantages, just was not able to cover the current needs. In Poland, housing cooperatives were able to run their own investments quite early, that is, since 1956. But only since mid-1980s, private investors, and here I mean individual investors, were encouraged to construct, in particular, single-family houses. But actually, no kind of existing then law provided answer to question how to build a city with almost only single-family houses. There were no regulations or satisfactory directions on capacity of the area, density, uh, ratio, ratio of intensive and ex extensive development, and so on. A social demand uh, was to construct mainly single-family houses. Regarding Strzeszyn, before launching competition, municipality collected so-called applications, a kind of survey on expected form of housing made among potential investors, large state enterprises, factories, institutions, but also small cooperatives and several thousand individuals. That's why Poznan municipality decided to ask a chosen group of architects, it was a competition for only 10 invited teams of architects, expecting the outcome to take the form of a regulatory development plan. But also the case of Strzeszyn provides an interesting example where authorities didn't want to just hand over the land to investors. It was uh, explained directly in the competition's assessment criteria, where the municipality was indicated as the driving force behind development and responsible for building the basic infrastructure. 
Private investors, small cooperatives, associations and construction companies are described here merely as contractors. In fact, it was cities' attempt to not only maintain control over the development of ERA, the goal was to create a system where it gets regular income from gradual selling of plots and invents and invests that uh, income to create technical and social infrastructure. In this way, municipal authorities expected to receive administrative and economic instruments to organize the urban economy, space and construction. And of course, the competition took place, was resolved in April 1986. A team of architects from Warsaw won, and that is uh, Janusz Falkiewicz, Janusz, Janusz Szymański and Piotr Wicha, working under the umbrella of the cooperative for the creative work of architects and artists, ESPEA. The winning team proposed a kind of main street in the center of the area, with direct connections with highways and with the layout of residential streets, as well as with the Poznań Strzeszyn and Poznań Podolany railway stops. Oh, okay, it's not working anyway. Um, along these main streets were located buildings of the highest intensity, that is uh, two and three storeys buildings. Um, they were small residential houses with built-in basic services, such as trade and crafts. Uh, in the immediate vicinity of this street, high-intensity single-family housing has been designed in the form of terraced, atrial and chain, and chain buildings. Development towards the ecological strip takes a more extensive form uh, of semi-detached and freestanding buildings with larger plots of land. Uh, ecological wedges, that means corridors connecting the main green belt, were designed per per perpendicular to the uh, adopted road system. Sports and recreational services and buildings such as schools, kindergartens and nurseries were located next to these wedges. Uh, this proposal assumed a population of 25,000 inhabitants, what made about 5,000 building plots. It was established that 10% of area will be covered with small residential houses with services. 70% will be areas of uh, intensive development, so this uh, single family houses, and 20% of extensive buildings. The opinion of uh, competition jury was not very enthusiastic, describing proposed solutions as correct. Real emotions can be found in records of post-competition discussion. Uh, Stefan Miller, one of prominent Polish architects, admitted, quote, the winning sketch is very fashionable, catchy, European and fits our abilities. But also he immediately added, you can't make people happy with single family houses. This proposal is a certain crossing of the border. It is a private way of thinking only for rich people. And this socio social aspect should be taken into account. End of quote. Another architect from Poznań, Manfred Pietz, uh, who participated in the competition, uh, added, quote, Typical residential units here are formed with typical terraced houses. It's just total typification and unification. If the choice of work was to indicate urban planning trends for the city, then this verdict is a powerful step backwards." End of quote. Also, a limit of inhabitants seemed uh, disputable. Member of competition jury, Andrzej Kiciński, claimed that 25,000 is just too much, while Jerzy szczepanik dzikowski who was uh, with uh, Piotr Wicha, one of the designers of uh, Ursynów district, um, he received his uh, competition entry, received second position due to providing too much multifamily housing, replied, in Ursynów district, which is similar to Strzeszyn, we made 60,000. Uh, 
We approached the issue differently as to use the city's money in the most economical way. The upper limit should be verified. I would like rational use of land to be an obligation." End of quote. Despite criticism, on September... Okay, it's... Hope it will get... Okay. Despite criticism, on September 25th, uh, 1986, the Municipal National Council in, Poland, in Poznań adopted the winning competition design as assumptions for the local special development plan. And the authors of the awarded competition entry were entrusted with the preparation of the whole document. The mentioned detailed plan has been approved, but, they do, but the document is no longer in municipal archive. This is why I reconstruct a detailed, uh, detailed description of the administrative and legal solutions on the basis of complaints that were regularly lodged until 1990 by one of the authors of the winning work, architect Piotr Wicha. One of his main concerns was that municipality failed in the main element of this plan, that is to establish an institution that would collect funds oversee the course of designing and managing the construction process and represent the city's interests. This institution was supposed to combine some functions of housing cooperative, so investor, and some specific functions of local authorities and administration. Viha extensively complained that municipality did not participate in the preparation of construction sites and no longer seemed interested in leading active policy towards numerous investors driven by conflicting uh, interests. And that actually ruined whole ambitions plan. How did it happen? In fact, in 1988, facing numerous strikes, city authorities publicly uh, promised to hand over construction plots in session to the employees of local factories. Architects from the SPA cooperative, recognizing the situation, quickly completed the implementation plans and conception designs for the first stage of development. Uh, as it was necessary to feel, uh, fulfill some legal requirements uh, before handing over the plots. They did it also because the agreement with the investor guaranteed them the right to make construction designs and thus uh, the, re the realization uh, of um, the author's conception. But soon the exception became a rule. Ideally, the detailed spatial development plan was supposed to be the basis for determining the order and timetable of development of individual plots, developing in implementation plans and geodetic works. New owners would receive the notarial deeds, so a title of ownership, to plots chosen according to their needs. After signing agreement with the city on the price of the plot and obligation to construct new buildings according to imposed conceptual designs. Obtaining building permission depended on full compliance with the approved uh, implementation plans and architectural complex concepts of entire urban complexes. In fact, after the implementation, plans with conceptual designs were approved by the Poznań city architect. They were indeed handed over uh, to direct investors. But main organization, uh, organizational rules were not followed. Agreements were not even prepared for signing. The location and type of houses often did not meet the needs of investors, and the allocation was decided by chance. Also, architects complained that the notarial deeds of land ownership were issued before the technical documentation was developed and the building permit was obtained, as well as without the investor's obligation to comply with the approved plan and design. 
individual investors received their ownership title upon payment of a fee that uh, was no more than 25 per mille of their market prices. No wonder Piotr Wicha was worried. By acting this way, municipality actually lost control over the development process and the opportunity to obtain funds. Also, other new sources of investment capital were not created, such as bonds, credits, lease of land, and so on. This situation strongly restrained infrastructure investments. Design for municipal uh, open areas, such as streets, squares, were not prepared, as these places did not have any host or responsible unit. Since nature upholds a vacuum, at the beginning of 1989, investors took over the steering of the development of the district. Especially one of housing cooperatives tried to coordinate processes, but due to the lack of appropriate powers, wasn't able to enforce subordination of other actors. As a result, individual investors commissioned technical documentation and cost construction designs to other architects, not the ones from SPA cooperative. And those architects took little or no interest in maintaining technical, special and architectural solutions adopted in the competition design or local development plan. Since schedule uh, for the development of technical documentation for buildings was not coordinated with the schedule of infrastructure design and implementation, invent investors often didn't follow even approved technical and special solutions regarding heat centers and distributions of installations in the buildings. The image of this investment anarchy was completed by the fact that the district architectural and uh, construction services also often openly question solutions and decisions approved a uh, level higher by the city authorities. Okay, so let's stop here for a moment um, because I find a strange pleasure in re referring all kinds of uh, failures, but I don't want to fail uh, to lose the main thread of my presentation in this dramatic landscape. Uh, so, session was conceived as an architectural but also legal and uh, administrative experiment aimed at strengthening local authorities municipal authorities, but also those on the district level, and creating framework for respecting the rights of residents. As such, it could have provided experimental model for a new type of socialist municipal agency that would support, on a local level, a kind of softer transition from socialist to democratic regime. Creating self-financing, efficient administration system based on principles of direct democracy was one of seriously discussed at the time scenarios of socio-economic reform, an alternative to rapid changes that followed the fall of socialist regime in Poland in 1989. So I guess I have a few minutes still. I wanted to make a short, uh, add a little postscriptum because uh, the regime change stopped completely the development of the district uh, for, the, for a long uh, period. And that's the uh, Delimitation Act from 2010. And as you can see, the development of the whole era is not very much advanced. And uh, as I was a few years ago collaborating on exhibition about history of, of Polish architecture, I was working a little bit on a session case and uh, asked uh, a photographer, yes, here are the comparison, and I asked the, uh, the photographer to document views from the main square of this uh, urban layout. Uh, and this is the Melchior Warnkowicz uh, square, which is round. And these are the views in the different <coughs> directions. So as you can see, still very much can be done about this uh, ARES. Um, he 
current development plans uh, due to market pressure uh, increased the density uh, of the development and uh, like are pushing towards multifamily housing uh, a lots of new development oh sorry uh, a lot of new development takes uh, place in the northern part of district so not here but in this empty areas uh, I wish uh, actually that the lesson from the experiment that took place uh, 30 years ago uh, was kind of learned by uh, Poznan municipality and this kind of um, you know uh, experimentative way and uh, ways of creating uh, experimental management over this land uh, were implemented. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. And uh, I'm passing the word to Maria Dremaite, Professor of Faculty of History of Vilnius University. Yes. Thank you. Hello. And thanks, Martina, that we are somehow finally put into one s session. And um, which is expected to develop the post-colonial discourse. And uh, of course, the question here arises, first of all, who's the colonist and who is the colonized? And how for the Baltic states, it was, it was pretty clear, but um, uh, how was postmodernism connected to all this reclaiming uh, identity, historical references, vernacular turn, etc. I think um, it is still interesting and important to research because this constant um, uh, thesis that uh, socialist postmodernism was merely an imitation of Western forms or journalny postmodernism, uh, the, the, the postmodernism redrawn from Western uh, architectural journals. But how much was it connected to the vernacular turn resulting in search of local spirit and overuse of historical references and with this emphasis on the genius Loki, vernacular elements, historical identity. Uh, I think it, uh, it, is an, it might be a good position in research in East Bloc postmodernism. And uh, my presentation and my paper will be focused on the 80s architectural competitions in Vilnius, Lithuania, where a young generation of architects presented postmodern designs in close connection with historical identity, historical references. I will, I will dwell on the, some ideas that I have already published in the book about Baltic modernism, but this um, competition project and entries surfaced very recently when we were doing the exhibition about unbuilt Vilnius of the 20th century in Vilnius Museum, which uh, the, the exhibition is still on, and we made a publication about that, and uh, of course, the, the very term unbuilt projects were the field of experimentation in, in, and architectural competitions was a field of experimentation uh, in architecture which produced very fruitful ideas and I think it's a very good source of grasping these, uh, these uh, aspirations, uh, desires, not only to look postmodern but also to reclaim identities. An overview article titled On the Crossroads of Architectural Exploration, appearing in 1979 issue of the Lithuanian trade magazine Construction and Architecture, was the first so far official and open discussion in the Lithuanian press about postmodernist architecture. Events taking place for more than a decade beyond the Iron Curtain could not long longer be ignored, but the question arose. 
How should Soviet Lithuania react to, him, to them? The anonymous author of the piece grappled with the common problem plaguing Soviet ideology, devising the correct way to assess Western postmodernism. The author's final analysis, though critical, was unable to mask a certain amount of curiosity. I quote the, uh, the con conclusion. Postmodernism is foreign to us, but the creative explorations and theoretical concepts of the postmodernist are rather interesting. Manifestations of postmodernism could be already found in Soviet Lithuanian architecture as early as late 70s. Though these were not accompanied by rebellious manifestos, the aim was to move from the global or all union standardization to the local, encouraging a search for regional identities. Professor Algimantas Machulis considers the first Lithuanian postmodernist building to be a club with an arc and portal motif designed by Romualdas Shilinskas in Palanga in 79. But when Machulis referred to Shilinskas as a pioneer of Lithuanian postmodernism, Shilinskas responded, that he never had postmodernism in mind for his design, since he then didn't know what postmodernism was. Thus, architects repeatedly acknowledged the M and emphasized the formal side of Lithuanian postmodernism or, or these redrawn designs. However, the architectural competitions show that postmodernism was already present in Lithuanian architecture and was closely connected with the emergence of a new, young generation of architects. Even... Uh, okay, one more... It's this slide. <laughs> Even uh, postmodernism was viewed as a new style with a Western, for some even anti-Soviet flavor, uh, where I can quote uh, the uh, contemporary uh, Odris Karalus. He was an architectural student at the time of 82, but now he is a well-known critic. And he recalled that the most significant event came in 82 with the publication of the Vilnius Urban Construction Designs Institute's Young Architects Design Catalog, which he called a bomb. Uh, and I quote him, the very existence in the Soviet Union of this small black and white publication hinted at unprecedented courage and the architecture of the young contributors verged on the audaciously anti-Soviet. Since he was a very uh, rhetorical person, he even then described that he felt that Marxist-Leninist uh, ideology cracked in the walls of Architectural Institute after this publication. So also we can see this uh, sort of dissent connected with postmodernism. And the architectural competitions for the young generation who was not able to build or to construct yet became actually the main place and an extremely important laboratory for new ideas and innovation in the 80s. Um, and you can see these uh, designs. And uh, um, for example, some... Uh, architectural competitions were for this humanization of urban environment, as Martinez already showed. Uh, a pedestrian zone plan in the center of Vilnius was proposed, this uh, architectural competition in 1981. And you can see that in, this, in these designs, uh, there was uh, an aim uh, to transform the street into a pedestrian boulevard lined with public buildings, a system of smaller design objects like benches, lights, and green spaces. And it all was very friendly to small, to, de to postmodernist design elements that uh, could be easily produced and installed. Um, and you can, can see different passageways and especially the aesthetics of the drawings. But I would draw your attention to another very important uh, competition, 
for the location and the idea of the art gallery in Vilnius, which was announced in 83 by the Lithuanian Union of Architects. It was initiated by architect Genvinas Baravikas, who was already introduced to you in, in Martina's um, ex uh, presentation. He, at that time, headed the Young Architects section of the Lithuanian Union of Architects. And according to another architect, Richardas Krishtapavichus, who participated in the competition, only young architects took part in this competition. And this creative enthusiasm is evidenced by the fact that as many as 24 groups submitted projects and a place for the gallery was planned in the historic center of Vilnius or the old town. It was proposed to revive, transform, restore, or renovate forgotten spaces in the historic town of Vilnius that were destroyed or damaged during the post-war modernization. And it is very interesting to see that all groups of architects proposed somehow to build up or to revive those especially squares or uh, boulevards that were the result of post-war modernization, which was perceived in Lithuania as the Soviet destruction of the old town, of, our, of the beautiful historic city. So the movement was also influenced very much by the growing interest in history. The latest research by the Institute of Restoration of Monuments, archaeological excavations, and trendy postmodernist architecture among young architects for example, uh, the Leo and Rob Crier brothers uh, in, in uh, experiments and the Barcelona experiment. So it was an invitation for architects to return to the historic sites of the cities. Also, the an informal name of the National Gallery was also deliberately emphasized in the competition task. And these submitted competition entries reveal the phenomenon of reclaiming historical memory in Vilnius architecture. You can see here the uh, entire uh, historic city with its quarters and the uh, definition of where possible museums can be located and the connection of other cultural places. And uh, the proposal to build up one, uh, one uh, neglected uh, quarter. Also, some a visualization of rebuilding the Genbinas Castle and to build the National Gallery in down down the main historical place. Also, to build up the entire block, which was destroyed after, in '54. You can see the evaluation of '54 here, and then the later design of, uh, from '54 to clean up and we put the greenery in this square. Another site for, for, re, for reconstruction was the uh, square in the historic uh, place, which was also destroyed after 54. And you can see the proposal to make a green square, which was never built there. But the new postmodernist National Gallery is proposed in 83. And the main, probably, the, the main competition site was this Vokechu Street, or which was called Museum Street in the Soviet period. The very, very small version of Kreshetik in the old town of uh, Vilnius, which you can see is really short, but the part of historic court, uh, blocks was uh, demolished, the street widened it up, and, uh, and the boulevard was installed. So there were several ideas to build up this, uh, these quarters and uh, this line of buildings. But especially interesting is probably this uh, reconstruction project uh, by young architects uh, in 87 already, which uh, who presented three versions of, of, uh, of uh, uh, designs from building up to marking with some fundamentals. Uh, it's interesting that uh, after presenting this design at the Vilnius Council of Architecture, they 
uh, received the verdict to try to design this in a simpler way. So it was not uh, approved. So it's evident that um, young Lithuanian architects in the 80s attached importance to issues such as regionality, national identity, uniqueness, uh, traits that were well suited to the historical styles and unique interpretation of architectural heritage promoted by postmodernism. Uh, complexity of arrangements, attention to context and urban history manifested itself in a rather generalized conceptual form of the local spirit that was associated with the historical environment. But in this case, I think it is interesting how they reclaim historical sites, places, but they try to interpret that or reconstruct them in postmodern manner. So imitation is absolutely eliminated as a method of reconstruction. Some other spaces uh, that were cleaned up in the 60s by the socialist modernization. And I would like also to draw your attention at this one experimental uh, competition design. Uh, of the stereo and video cinema theater, which was very fashionable as a, as a uh, technological novelty at Tilto Street in the Old Town. And both the first prize winners and second prize winners actually did not destroy the volume of the building. They kept the volume of the building, but they proposed the postmodernist interpretation of architectural style. And it was the first project that was stopped by the Social Heritage Protection Movement, who was also very active in this perestroika period from 85 to 88. And uh, it, now it, we talked to, in this conference a lot about consequences. And what were the consequences of these experiments that were not realized? So I think the consequences were in two directions or in two vectors. This, uh, uh, this picture you have already seen in Mar Martina's presentation, it was the micro rayon center, shopping mall with the polyclinics, uh, pharmacies, uh, etc. for Shishkine large housing estate. So what's, what's different uh, when we look the, when we relocate from the old town? And what's different if we compare this with the Podil uh, district that we visited yesterday? This area did not have historical background. So in this case, we see that architects propose to relocate old town structures into the completely different environment, mass housing areas, in this case to humanize somehow or to bring up uh, structures that are relevant to Old Town. Another direction uh, could be seen in the later competitions when Lithuania regained independence in 1990 and in, in, in 1991 uh, mm, the new ideas how to mark the old town place spaces with this independence uh, memorials or some very important buildings that should be reconstructed started. And the competition in 1994 was announced for reconstruction of the Grand Duke Palace, which was politically associated with the renovation of the state, the uh, statehood and the national pride. So it is interesting that among six competition entries, five were postmodern and they reinterpreted uh, historical environment because uh, the fundaments were exposed by archaeological uh, excavations and everybody agreed that uh, original fundament is a main value of the site. And iconographical material was not enough. So it was com common, uh, com commonly agreed upon the, the idea that since we do not know how exactly the palace was, we are allowed to interpret. So five, uh, five entries were postmodern, but one was the imita imitating um, 
reconstruction project, and you can guess which one. So I think this, uh, these competitions of the 80s uh, show this liberal interpretation in the postmodernist way, which was not later acceptable for a very important historical sites. I think that's the end. Okay, we thank you to all three speakers and uh, I have to pass the word to the audience. Please, your questions, your comments and your microphone. So I have, uh, <clears throat> I start from comment to Martina's lecture because you said that the, uh, showing Pruitt I go to together with the last deny that it was uh, completely different epoch. I don't know this last deny only from this one photo, but I would say that there was no, uh, not complete different epoch because these uh, towers you show, they have uh, a very strong uh, articulated base and uh, and the top, so it is the postmodern interpretation. In contrary, for example, to Bill Lemmermer in Amsterdam, which was started in 1972 in ve very, very strict modernist, uh, modernist manner. Then I will ask you a technical question about this architecture du jour du in Russian version. Wa wa was it open, uh, accessible for everybody who wanted in so so Soviet Union? or it was somehow limited. And then, then I have the question to Alicia Gzowska that you say that the, the plan after 2010 has, uh, 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 ha, 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 or the plan of two, to, after 2000 has introduced uh, uh, multifamily housing to session. And, uh, and ha, how, how do you co uh, will combine it with the fact that you said that after initial uh, the competition, many people criticize it for only single families. So, is it somehow uh, approaching the point of view of the critics of uh, of in initial project, or it is the other way? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. So, maybe I would comment a little bit about Lesdina and. Uh, uh, we might consider it that it might have some postmodern elements, but uh, basically I think that it's uh, like uh, what I concluded with, that uh, it might be as an attempt to transform, improve and humanize uh, Soviet modernization but in, in that sense. And uh, the comparison with, with Prayutaygu housing, it's like uh, has some uh, social connotations which were absent in, 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 in Soviet environment. So that was uh, the idea behind this uh, uh, comparison. And uh, uh, about the um, uh, architectural press or uh, well, these uh, magazines were widely available and uh, also, you can compare with this post-war uh, generation of architects uh, who uh, at some point told that uh, they seen uh, foreign magazines like as uh, in the 50s, while they have already f graduated. And it was the first time when we saw modern architecture in the magazines. So this uh, like vacuum of, of information was, uh, was, was really present in the 50s. And later, it was uh, like uh, this information was more and more accessible. And this uh, particular magazine, L'Architecture de Jordui, it was, uh, uh, as it started, it was a really bilingual uh, magazine, uh, which uh, contained like uh, bilingual texts in, 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 in French and in Russian. And at some point, it has transformed into like uh, a Xerox copy. And th there was only this. Uh, Russian name on, on, on the cover and that was it but the inside was all, 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 all uh, French and black and white so I think in this particular library that even they might have these copies I have one at home uh, 
I don't, I don't know about this uh, original, but uh, this uh, print run was, uh, I think it, it was even uh, like uh, copied in this uh, project, uh, like institute, so you cannot say. I, I think it was like semi-official in a way at, at some point. Yeah, I have my question of my own, but let let Alicia uh, uh, answer first, and then. Uh, so, Hubert, it's the kind of question about how dense the city should be, and uh, I think there is no consensus about that. And uh, honestly speaking, for me, uh, as now we can see many uh, versions of this neoliberal. Uh, very dense uh, quarters. So for me, very much more interesting is the proposal of creating a city and, you know, um, integrated city, uh, part of the city uh, with single family houses uh, done with this uh, multifamily houses. I know there is this economic uh, factor that uh, makes the uh, case more complex, uh, but uh, uh, apparently, in this late socialist situation, um, this experiment was uh, particularly interesting because it was possible. Okay. Um, thank you very much for for, for very interesting um, um, the well presentations. Um, I'd like to ask Martinez and, and Maria specifically. Um, because it's 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 very close to what I expected from the conference. So this is the level, so the architectural level of discussions that I, I'd expect. Um, I'm curious about the sort of uh, strands of postmodernism and how they um, penetrated into the Soviet Union. So I've been told that there was a new European tradition, an American one, which were very different in in what the basic message of new architecture and I would say Americans very much about consumerism, of course, the exceptions like Hans Hollein, uh, I would say, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and there is a European tradition which is much more about the city. And obviously, in, in Lithuania, you have both, and you see it in the images. Um, and there is the third strand, I could say, that just Martinez just mentioned, which is the humanization of uh, the socialist way of life and the, um, the environment. Um, could you say, was were there any sort of differences uh, between the strands, how they were presented? Um, did people discuss it? Or was it just like, uh, as I said, foreign postmodernism coming into our Soviet architecture? Thank you. Well, your question reminds me uh, yesterday's discussion when you asked architects what were the inspiration models. And uh, they were very frank about saying what happened on site. If we looked at one magazine, we were interested in that. If some special publication came out, we were interested in that in Kenzo Tanga or whatever. So I think it is a very interesting entire question or research uh, field of how international ideas reached Soviet architects, and it can't be then uh, generalized as Soviet architects. For example, we constantly talk about this strict uh, lack, lack of information, restricted uh, access to information. But look at certain groups of architects. For example, Lithuanians, they from the 60s, they had connection with emigre Lithuanians in, in the States. They got all magazines, of course, in the, not in the mass amount. Uh, but if there existed several issues in the collective, they Xeroxed it in the, in the institute and spread it. In Estonia, they read everything in, transla in translation. In Moscow, they translated everything into Russian. So there were groups of architects who were interested in intel intellectual discourse, and there were architects who were interested in uh, visual material. They liked the forms, shapes, and they imagined that, they, that this would fit and this would look modern. Also, I think it is very interesting to research the competition who gets the first access to the newest issue of the book or magazine. And this information is usually secured from others. 
because there is a competition who first uh, presents the in most uh, novel international idea in local environment. So there is a lot of uh, tension between groups of architects and I think that those who wanted to participate in intellectual discourse of postmodernity, for example, like Gediminas Baravikas himself, he had a group of architects around him because he wanted to have discussions, debates. Of course, it was all um, complemented with heavy drinking and uh, discussing in bars, etc. Yeah, but it was the, the subcultures, so professional subcultures. But there were also people who, who did, were not interested and maybe they had uh, architecture or, or, or they were probably not even, uh, were, were not keen of, of uh, renewing this. So uh, once we wrote that in a, in a, in a commentary that uh, Soviet postmodernism lacked irony, the, yeah, the, the generation of architects who were active in 83 said, we lacked our own and presented us with different drawings that were never published, but, but it was in the discourse. So again, we, we must talk about the source of our writings, of our research. There's so much unpublished source. But of course, it's accompanied with so much mythology today. How avant-garde they were, how progressive they were, and the, uh, how much difficult boundaries they broke in in access, in gaining the information in access of information i think the, the uh, this can be generalized as a soviet architect's access to international material yeah just a small remark that i think that uh, it was really a watershed moment uh, well, for me, when architects uh, started uh, reading books and reflecting in this, like, eight, uh, 1980s, which uh, I think didn't happen a lot before. And so, for instance, uh, uh, as we have interviewed the architects, they were, for instance, uh, uh, very favor of paper architecture from Moscow. And then uh, they had this, uh, their own uh, uh, architectural competition for students, uh, which we haven't mentioned, but which was like uh, like locally famous, but they also invited the uh, Moscow architects and some of the architects also said that it's the only good thing that came out of this postmodern tendency. It's like, uh, like uh, ideas and just uh, ability to, to, to communicate and to discuss. Just, just, just a, uh, but wasn't it thus the difference between between two generations, even if they produced similar forms, that the new generation, well, cared about ideas, uh, and the previous generations who, well, moved from modernism, they stayed with just an experiment, uh, well, formal experiments. Well, I would comment that uh, the tension was there, but uh, the. Uh, I, you mean between the modernists and postmodernists, or different, different uh, generations of postmodernists? Different generations of making, making, making postmodern architecture. Okay. But actually, it was uh, all one generation. Basically, they were very sim they had similar sensibilities and similar like uh, views on, 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 on how to, to produce architecture, how, how to make architecture. And uh, basically, yeah, they even. They, 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 they even uh, were not many conflicts with this modern generation of these modernists. Like, well, they, I think they looked upon each other a little bit, but uh, in a way they have supported each other also. So, I don't know. I think uh, the master of Nasvitis once came into the class, I, I remember this from the interview, and approved <laughs> postmodernism as, okay, you are working in a good direction. So it was in a way informally legitimized. I, 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 I have a question to Alicia, which very interesting case, very interesting presentation. Um, my question is about the last chapter that you mentioned of your story, the 2019, uh, which actually doesn't really look like a, a drama of defeat, uh, but 
my question is, is that just my impression? I see a rather orderly plan with certain postmodern elements. You have a circular square in the in the middle. There is a church. There are buildings with some historic references, with pitched roofs, um, a certain density. Uh, so all these are elements that you would could call postmodern and are similar to the principles of the original um, plan. So my question, is that just my impression or was there some continuity eventually after the, the period of uh, desultory developments that you describe in the 1990s? Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, question, really, uh, there is some kind of continuity regarding this uh, urban scheme. Uh, because, uh, well, some decisions were kind of, you know, executed, roads were built, uh, savage was put into the land and so on. Uh, that's how uh, this uh, postmodern uh, development plan influences the reality now. Uh, but uh, when we come to the questions of density of functions, uh, for example, those uh, mixed functions uh, are not anymore in the current development plans. Nowadays, uh, all the services, uh, trade and so on, is uh, placed on this green outskirts of the district, uh, which is like, again, a step back towards uh, functional planning and, you know, dividing the uh, the functions and also uh, the municipal investor stepped back kind of forever. Uh, I mean, no schools are being built, uh, no um, kindergartens, playgrounds, sports uh, facilities and so on. Uh, and uh, well, there is a drive toward pushing this kind of investments now uh, on this private uh, developers, but, uh, well, it's kind of tendency, it's not really well uh, performed, and uh, usually uh, the, the plans uh, allow just the construction of housing, high-density housing, and just nothing left is there anymore. So from this postmodern shape, there is this now very... Uh, much poorer quality of, of living. Thank you for this wonderful panel, uh, which also opened so many uh, prospects to sinking into the legacies of these discussions and also showing different scenarios within the state socialism, how in different ways it could be developed on different scales as well. Uh, for me, quite telling was the quote by the architect who was named the first postmodernist <laughs> of Lithuania and who actually declined this, uh, this status and saying, well, I, I have no idea what it is. So I'm wondering about, um, like, about the method of interview, uh, which you applied, Martinez, Maria, and probably Alicia as well. Like, when talking with those people and talking with those architects and asking them uh, what actually you were doing, how does it no, uh, name this thing? Did they use postmodernism at all? Did they call it historic architecture, vernacular architecture, like local architecture, whatsoever? And did the word postmodernism at all appear in their narratives? And also, you briefly mentioned this mythology and how they approach their practice uh, from the 70s and 80s from the perspectives of, I believe you made those interviews in the last decade, when you have this time gap in between and when there the certain way of speaking about the socialist uh, project was established in different contexts in Poland and in Lithuania. So usually it's a context of rejection and critique. So how do they see and uh, inscribe their practice into this project, not only by contradiction with it, but maybe also like with certain dialogue? The, the very idea of uh, my presentation and this research uh, was probably to propose the uh, idea that Soviet postmodernism can be researched as a process sui generis. 
sort of, because we, all, we almost all, always hear that it was the copy of Western postmodernism. And in some countries it was better copied or more precisely copied, and in some, in some countries less uh, knowledge was uh, acquired, so it was copied worse. But what you say, that maybe it was a, this historical turn or a rustic turn or vernacular turn that inspired, but uh, in combination with postmodern turn, it produced something very locally specific in the field of social uh, state socialism with its construction scarcity. Because I remember one discussion with uh, those post young postmodernist architects who are now in their 60s, uh, and uh, one of them immediately emigrated to Germany in the early 90s, in, in 1888 or 90, uh, Alfredo Strimonis. And then he said that when I saw how this postmodernism is implemented in Western Germany, I said, oh my God, we all we tried to do this all with the red brick and uh, concrete uh, and uh, bright paint. So uh, I mean that they were able to get knowledge about intellectual discourse. They uh, were able to get knowledge about the f shapes and forms, but they were not able to experience the processes. And uh, this knowledge was available, but not everywhere, not openly. So I still uh, support, the, or, or, or it was very important what yesterday architect said, that what was on the spot, what we noticed, then we developed on this, but it was not the whole picture. So it might be interpreted as a very local process with combination of different aspects. I think now I have this, uh, this impression. But Martinez has written a dissertation on that, so maybe he has more ideas. Well, well I think there is this transition uh, from like uh, appearing of this term, and uh, Maria mentioned year 1979 when it was uh, first officially mentioned in the architectural magazine, and as early as like 1980, just one year after, it was uh, like officially. Uh, it, it, it's not that it was adopted, but I think it was like the high hopes of, of this generation of architects that uh, this uh, way of architecture would produce something similar to this national style. Well, that was my impression, actually. So, yeah, there was this transition from this like uh, architectural tendency somewhere like uh, in, in some other place, then it became adopted. And uh, But yeah, these architects uh, like used uh, the term postmodernism uh, between themselves and in this architectural press, and they even the call each other or themselves postmodernism. But uh, uh, if you look at the public discourse, this, uh, of course, this uh, uh, intellectual uh, discourse was not there. I mean, it, there was not even uh, the term modernism. I think it was not applied in in in, in late Soviet context even, because everything was like. Uh, uh, functionalism or contemporary architecture, современная архитектура in general, and that was it. So it was like, uh, like you could say, postmodernism without modernism in a way. But yeah, the, but it's about this theoretical level of discussions. So, uh, Natalia, addressing the other part of your question. <laughs> And the Polish postmodern architects absolutely hate the word uh, postmodernism and they treat it as a kind of label that harms them and uh, uh, puts, in, puts them in a really bad light. Uh, they prefer in general to be called um, kind of, uh, you know, contemporary architects, eclectists or anti-modernists and that's also a very important division. Uh, that probably also stems from um, the career that word postmodernism had uh, in, uh, in, I don't know how in other countries, but at least in, in Poland there was this wave of uh, understanding postmodernism as this anti-cultural tendency against traditions and that was probably one of many reasons they didn't want to uh, be uh, kind of, you know, associated with uh, with that. 
And regarding the debate discussion, uh, well, I got a very strong opinion on Polish uh, architects uh, who did postmodern uh, buildings that they didn't read anything. And even if they re read some translations or uh, you know, uh, publications in uh, different languages, they read it as an artist do when they read philosoph philosophy. They just adapt some notions and uh, adapt them to their own practice. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, any kind of discussion about books, about some ideas, uh, usually ended up like, I always wanted to be a painter. So. So I would like to say that there are some few architects who like to say they are postmodernists. There is Andrzej Ryba, which is not not very mainstream architect, and uh, Michał Owadowicz, and also I don't know how now, but Dariusz Kozłowski from Krakow in the mid of 90s, there was in television the film showing him as a postmodern, postmodern architect. So maybe he changed his mind, but in that time when I was studying, uh, there was film when he was uh, telling how he is postmodernist. Uh, Andrzej Ryba has kind of dementia and uh, every, kind, every interview he says something different. <laughs> uh, I'm just uh, recalling the conference in Warsaw two years ago. I think Florian and Maria was already also there and there was a panel about um, um, well, it w was something like an interview about the literature where there were a lot of questions, what did you read? And I think different Polish architects uh, tried to invent the, the answers. And, and it, was, it was also kind of in between for me, a feeling like, yes, in a way, the literature somehow in the architecture, especially when you have to, well, Western uh, literature is definitely better than Soviet one or, or Polish one. But, and this feeling was like the translation itself um, did not make maybe such a difference at that point, but the the ability, you know, to um, maybe reinterpret, and that was not the thing. Maybe you need to read the text to the last letter, or maybe just that you feel that the maybe the the time um, and the ability to this this criticism, which was of course on the other level uh, in the U.S. or in in the Western Germany or in the U.K. on the postmodernism, and I and I feel this discussion about literature it was is still kind of a recurring issue. Like people ask architects if you read, and they and that's at the same point they want to answer yes, but they know that this is not a completely uh, yes answer in, in any case. Okay, we have three questions. Boris was the first. I can share. Uh, thanks for the speeches, it was amazing. I have two questions about today's uh, Lithuania and Poland, uh, about the uh, reaction of the public, of the first question about the non-architects, uh, uh, the users uh, of the, 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 those buildings. Are, are they ready to protect uh, this heritage of 80s postmodernism, and how do they get it? Uh, um, and the other about uh, the young ar architects, so a new generation of ar architects, um, uh, we know that some fresh trends rhyme with the style of uh, the, the 80s. Uh, do they citate or, or uh, re refer somehow and is it uh, aware uh, or not? Uh, do, they, uh, do they visit exhibitions, research? Uh, thank you. Okay, so quickly about the users, um, they are very likely to protect their uh, own private property, uh, but they don't recognize the whole assembly, our urban assembly as a kind of heritage that should be protected, probably because they don't know the history of this place. Uh, and they have never been confronted with all these uh, ideas, but still um, there are some uh, quarters, some blocks developed in uh, 
late 80s and some more contemporary structures. And of course, there are some antagonisms between these uh, groups of people, uh, mainly because they have a different living standard and uh, the new ones are often perceived as the one who, I don't know, make the water pressure lower. <laughs> and that's why the, the, the first one cannot uh, live the life they had previously. <laughs> Well, I, I can say that in Lithuanian heritage um, discourse, the postmodernism is not alien already. Some, uh, some objects are listed, uh, but um, there is tension of developers, of course. Uh, and uh, we can see this varying rhetoric. For example, if uh, there is a need to demolish some building, it's a Soviet monster. If there is a need to list it, it's an interesting Lithuanian architecture of postmodernist period. So it's it's not a, there is no common values, but uh, I know that Martinez was involved in listing the most con the building that was built in. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we we have the. The youngest building in the heritage list of Lithuania is actually postmodern because it goes from 1996, just already after the independence, and it's a bank, bank building in, in, in central Vilnius. And it's, yeah, it's the, the, the youngest one because we have the same quota of, of like 50 years of, of considering of enlisting buildings in uh, the heritage list, but there are exceptions. and. This was the exception. I wouldn't talk too much about this. Uh, um, uh, wh 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 why it was enlisted, but uh, yes. Uh, well, the first uh, like uh, building that I have shown this gallery is enlisted. So I think that uh, this national registry has uh, like six or seven buildings which are which has this tag postmodernism in the description list. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of other problems that uh, some of the buildings are enlisted, like uh, Maria showed the Shishkine uh, shopping district, which is enlisted, but uh, there are no formal values of, of this building which are to be considered. So no, no, no values attributed to the building, so it should be reconsidered uh, again. So yeah. So... We, we, yeah, so it's, we, we, we do have the protected buildings, but uh, uh, we also have demolished buildings, as Maria said, and quite, quite good ones. No, and the second... Uh, okay. And what about the new generations of our architects? Uh, how do they, they, do they drop some references on the 80s style? Do they appreciate it to visit uh, your exhibitions? Citations or something. Well, uh, uh, quotation. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, if we speak, uh, what, what kind of appreciation? I mean, uh, uh, they are not Qu interested. Quotes, maybe. Sorry. It's quotes, maybe. You know, Easter eggs. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that uh, they might not be interested in in, in postmodern architecture per se. But for instance, uh, we have a lot of activities like. Uh, uh, raising awareness about uh, architectural heritage and we have uh, several wonderful uh, activities like open house Vilnius and these postmodern buildings are very very popular and uh, for instance uh, uh, the architects were the ones who just uh, try to, 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 to defend the buildings that are to be demolished and they are really uh, like supportive uh, for, 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 for but maybe it's just the professional support so, but, uh, yeah, the postmodern ideas uh, themselves, I mean, they, they, they are not, like, popular in, in, in that sense that they were popular in the 80s. So maybe there is a generational shift happening. Okay, I have to pass the microphone to Lukas, who is waiting for a long time. And that will be the last question and the last sharp answers, because we have five time extra. Great discussion. Thank you. 
Thanks. I have uh, one question to uh, Alicia um, about this administrative scheme which you discussed, this administrative part of the competition entry. So first, do you have a sense of what were the precedents for, for that proposal? You know, whether they referred to interwar uh, schemes or whether they referred to, let's say, foreign examples, let's say, you know, development corporations are good examples of how you can do things like that. And, the, and kind of related to that, whether the, you, you, have, you have, I think, done a very good job in discussing the controversies about the architectural part of that competition, you know, the question of density and how people were unhappy with it. And so I was wondering if there was any discussion at all about that administrative part of the, of the proposal. So you've got me here. I don't know about the precedents. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was digging a little bit in the history of uh, Poznan development, but uh, not. I was not paying much attention to that uh, that thing. Uh, well, there was this uh, strong sense of um, this um, self-governing in in the Poznan. Uh, which kind of uh, helped the city to uh, thrive after different regimes in the, being the, the part of different uh, countries. And uh, that was definitely kind of uh, really um, driving power that uh, pushed the uh, administration, pushed the municipality towards exper experimentation. But I'm not sure about any, any kind of... Uh, inspiration and um, about uh, debate about uh, administration thing there was no debate uh, I'm like uh, it was concerned uh, I, I, I strongly believe it's kind of uh, you know um, adaptation because of what happened um, in the mid 60s and 70s in the Silesia region uh, where there was this strong, very strong regional administration that uh, helped to create kind of political, uh, political uh, jump off for the uh, Edward Gierek. And then following these examples, there was a started kind of um, competition between other regions uh, where uh, the local uh, leaders tried to show themselves as very skillful, um, taking um, very well care about their citizens and uh, probably uh, in kind of this way of uh, functioning uh, Poznań tried to, I mean, the municipality of Poznań tried to uh, show themselves as a region that has the best uh, outcomes uh, regarding the numbers of uh, flats that were given to um, <clears throat> Uh, to inhabitants per year, for example. Okay, thank you. I think we have to stop here and continue all our discussions and questions during the lunch. And we, have, we are having an hour and 10 minutes break. And we will come back here for the session 3 at 3 p.m. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to s a short notice for everybody watching us uh, on, on online. So if you experience some issues with the connection that was on the, our, our side, um, anyway, if you want to re-watch the video, it will be available on the YouTube of the um, museum uh, this later this week or beginning the next one. See you. So thank you.